to go and check. Chris, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, welcome everybody to uh, our Monday morning talk. Uh, thank you all for staying through. Uh, all the all the weaklings have left by now. A few more weaklings will leave right after this, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. No, well, no, no. We have the enthralling flat fielding discussion, after which a lucky few will win a Takahashi. And if you, second prize is the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, yeah. uh, our, our speaker this morning, yeah. our speaker this morning is Chad Merrill from Earth Networks. Uh, he was, uh, uh, I think, a win for this week and uh, for this weekend. And unfortunately, because of his schedule, he was only able to come here today. And we really appreciate the fact that he dragged himself up here from, from uh, the far reaches of Maryland to speak with us. But um, after, our, after our experience last year, bringing in an ophthalmologist to talk about vision and astronomy, I was looking for someone specifically to talk about meteorology and astronomy, things we need to know uh, about why the weather we get is not the weather we think we're going to get. Uh, or in some cases, the weather we get is the weather we think we're going to get. We're, we're just hoping it isn't. Uh, but, you know, weather is what you get. Climate is what you expect. Uh, and we get weather. Uh, Chad is a professional meteorologist. He has a degree in meteorology. He's worked as an on-air meteorologist in Maryland. And um, he has now worked for the past 10 years at Earth Networks, with, which is a commercial meteorology firm that provides custom uh, forecasting information that is made specific, not made the way you like it, um, for commercial clients and, and I guess government organizations also. So please welcome Chad Merrill. Thank you very much, Alan, and thanks everyone. Uh, yeah, I work at Earth Networks and basically in our meteorological operations unit, we provide uh, detailed forecasts for power electric companies. Also, we have uh, large clients like Major League Baseball, NFL, Major League Soccer. So we cater forecasts to those uh, specific teams, um, rain amounts, cloud cover, and so forth and so on. So of course, this is our uh, busiest time of the year given that uh, we have NFL, Major League Baseball, and of course the, the tropical season. But uh, so we do forecasting for a, a wide range of clients at Earth Networks. So I'm going to talk today about interpreting forecast and model data, uh, weather service forecast and forecast model data for purposes of astronomy. I'm gonna start out with uh, talking a little bit about some of the biases and some of the larger models that uh, we, we analyze to actually produce forecasts through one to five, six, and seven days. And th these are some of the uh, forecast biases. In other words, some of the um, information that the GFS model produces that's either a little bit too much or a little bit uh, too little in terms of rain amounts and wind gusts and so forth. So first of all, when it comes to winter storms that cross uh, the Sierras, that's the western part of the US, um, this is just some information about some of the biases and. Uh, basically from west to east coast. So um, just talking about um, how the, the GFS model uh, interprets the data and some of the biases all across the country, not just specifically the east coast. But winter storms that cross the Sierra Mountains after about one and a half days um, tend to be a little bit too strong and move too fast in the GFS data. And this particularly impacts parts of the southwest. So it can have a little bit of a uh, faster movement with the storms than what actually occurs. East of the front range of the Rockies and west of the Appalachians, too much rain is produced from thunderstorms in localized areas. So this primarily happens during the spring, summer, and early fall, where if you look at a specific location, um, it might produce one to two inches of rain, where in reality, you might only get a quarter to a half of an inch of rain. So that's uh, called convective feedback in the modeling, and it's very common during the summertime months. What's that? You're talking about the predictions, not matching the... Not matching what actually happens, yeah. Don't, don't, doesn't the service compensate for that? Uh, the surface... Oh, the service. Sorry, I thought you said the surface. Um, yeah, th th what uh, meteorologists do is whenever we look at the model data and we try to figure out how much rain is going to fall in a certain location, we do interpret that data and then we make our forecast based on 
uh, looking at the biases, looking at the overall pattern. So we tend to take that information about the rain amounts and then we make our own forecast. So we tend to tailor back the rain amounts for, yeah, exactly. So these are some of the biases that uh, the GFS model, and then we take that information and then we produce our own forecast from it. Um, also, uh, north of where the GFS develops heavy rain from thunderstorms, east of the Front Range and west of the Appalachians, uh, there tends to be a, a bit of a void in the rain. So whenever we see that in the models, we take that into consideration. Uh, the, this void is a dry, it's a dry bias in the models. There tends to be a little bit more uh, than what actually happens. So you can see in some of the forecast models, um, thunderstorms and then north of an area, thunderstorms that the model predicts absolutely no rain. Whereas in reality, it's more smoothed out where you have thunderstorms, but to the north, you still have some rain that occurs, but it's not as heavy or as, in, or, uh, as intense, but uh, there's still a little bit more rain than what the model, model shows. And then it tends to have, an, uh, GFS tends to produce a larger area of light rain than what actually occurs. Um, and basically, when we're talking about this large area of, of rain bias in any part of the U.S., it's... Um, uh, so it tends the GFS tends to have a l large grid spacing points on the on the U.S. map or even the world where it in, it's taking model data from specific points across the U.S. But the the points are very they're spread apart. So what you see is an area a, a large area of rain when it should actually be much smaller in size. Um, so it's interpreting just between those two points when actually there's other uh, points that it that it doesn't ingest because of the magnitude of the of the model. So basically, it can produce a larger area of rain from w large weather systems, synoptic weather systems, um, but in the light range, only like a, t a tenth or a hundredth to a tenth of an inch of rain. And in the cold season, it tends to bring cold air too far south. This leads to more extreme temperatures after about three and a half days. So the GFS model tends to have a cold bias in the wintertime. Uh, a couple of other biases with it, uh, it's too far south with um, cold outbreaks and that tends to lead to more snow and then it tends to produce stronger storm systems east of the Rockies compared to what actually happens, especially after three and a half days out. Um, and also, they over time, yeah, over the course of time, they have adjusted some of the equations in the model. Um, they've made these adjustments and then they find out how the model is interpreting the data and its trends and then they continue to adjust it but they do adjust the equations in the model it just doesn't happen very often but ev occasionally they do like maybe once every two or three years right mm-hmm um, also, isn't it also true though that they try to not put in local patches to the models? They try to use the same. But they don't like too much resolution. The place. And then they find that this represents certain regions. Yeah, and certain. Mm -hmm. mean they know how to fix it. Except. And it also. Look at it. Yeah. It also, it's also with, has to do with the manpower of actually producing the model data. If you ingest so much, the more information that you ingest and the more grid points that you have in the model data, the longer it's going to take to produce the output. So that's also a problem. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we've heard about the European model. That's another forecast model. It uh, has a little bit higher resolution than the GFS. The grid points are closer together. So the European tends to have, has some biases, but also has some award-winning points to it. Um, it does best with predicting surface temperatures uh, October through April. It picks up on patterns that produce shallow layer of cold air at the surface, which can lead to ice storms. Um, upper level lows that develop in the southwest tend to be a little bit too strong with this model, and the European moves those lows a little bit too slow. Um, it can show temperatures too warm during the spring to early fall, 
but also during the warm season, it can show too many cutoff low pressures. These are low pressures that are cut off from the main flow of the jet stream that produce soggy weather over a long period of time for any one location. Uh, we tend to see uh, upper level lows get cut off from the jet stream across the Ohio Valley, um, sometimes across the southeast, especially during the fall season in the eastern part of the U.S. Um, in patterns with a strong ridge of high pressure aloft, it can show uh, low pressure approaching the western part of this ridge a little bit slower and farther north. So it does have some biases in terms of how it uh, moves weather systems across the country. Um, and it, but it does a, a better job uh, days four and five. So the mo model initiation time is, for example, Monday morning, four to five days would be looking at the uh, information for the for the weekend the model does show uh best where the cutoff low pressures will develop although they tend to be a little bit farther east so because of the resolution they do have some better uh place they, they do better in terms of placements of low pressures because they have a little bit more information that uh come into them yeah they have a much better computation power and they have there's more power that goes into the European model and there's a lot of grid spacing. So um, it's just overall tends to be a little bit more accurate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it takes into... Mm-hmm. Yeah, you look at the teleconnection patterns across the globe to see how the weather systems are going to migrate. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It, you can look at. No. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the GFS and the European model, uh, yeah, they predict weather all across the Northern Hemisphere, so Asia, North America, India, so forth and so on. Um, there's a couple other biases. Uh, it actually most accurately depicts Arctic cold fronts that come down east of the Rockies because of the fine resolution. So it does good with the cold air outbreaks and often, again, with, with cutoff lows in, in the Northwest, it has a l little bit of a problem. But overall, it's a pretty decent... Uh, model to look at, especially uh, when we get into uh, tropical forecasting, which I'll talk about Florence in a couple minutes, since that's a current weather scenario and current uh, forecast, and everyone has its their attention on it. Uh, the Europe, the NAM model, the North American model, does have pretty good resolution as well. It it focuses just on the weather in North America. Uh, it does tend to have a dry biases in the central U.S and it tends to uh, be too slow when developing thunderstorms uh, with uh, thunderstorms basically that develop along the periphery of heat ridges. We see that a lot in the June, July, and August where we have a complex of thunderstorms that develop maybe in the Dakotas and then migrate south and east. This model tends to show it moving too slow and in fact it tends to move a little bit faster. So these are just some of the model biases um, with uh, the NAM, the North American model, the GFS, and the European model. And um, also, I looked at a study from 2013 that evaluated the NAM, GFS, and another model, the WARF model. And the temp winter temperatures are often a little bit too cold, uh, dew points a little bit too low, and summer temperatures often uh, a bit too high. And this is with the um, North American model itself. But it did show 
the models, these three models actually show pretty good accuracy from midnight to just before daybreak, which is obviously when you're observing. So it actually does a pretty good job. It's just that uh, some of these forecast models have a little bit of a problem trying to pinpoint exactly where convection is going to develop in the afternoon, the magnitude of the storms, and um, the rain amounts. That's just something that uh, is interpreted by the forecaster, the meteorologist, and then looking at the particular pattern and seeing that that particular spot is going to see three inches of rain or is it going to see more like a half of an inch to an inch of rain. So as a meteorologist we take the model information, we look at the current scenario, we look at the pattern, we also look at the area around where the thunderstorms are forming if there has been a persistent drought, has there been a surplus in rain, because that can lead to a little bit more rain than normal. For example, we're in a very wet pattern, so we tend to see a little bit more rain than what is expected because of the pattern that we're in um, and the evapotranspiration from all the trees and plants and so forth and so on. So those are just a couple of things with the forecast models that meteorologists look at and um, try to decipher in terms of how the forecast is going to play out over the next couple of days in terms of rain amounts and cloud cover and so forth. Now when we look at uh, local forecasts, for example, this is the weather service forecast from late last week that covers all the way through Tuesday for this particular area um, in West Virginia. And there's some terminology here that I just want to go over. First of all, many of you might see the forecast and it talks about patchy fog. Um, patchy fog is basically fog in just a couple of different spots, but fog tends to develop, and I have another slide a little bit later that talks about um, areas that are prone to fog based on the weather pattern. So patchy fog can develop in the mountains, can develop in low-lying valleys, and so forth and so on. But the weather service forecast is usually pretty broad over a certain area, and that, of course, in this particular location, in even all across the Mid-Atlantic, there, s- there are so many different, what are called mesoscale or small scale, um, weather patterns that uh, that affect that affect regions. So you might see, you might basically on a, a night with clear skies have radiational fog in the valley, but then go up into the mountaintop and it's clear. So. The Weather Service u- uses terms like patchy fog because they're covering a broad area. In one county, you can have a ridge valley system and you can have fog in one area and it's clear on top of the mountain. So they basically use that patchy to, to basically broad brush the fog potential. And, the, per- and the, the chance of rain, 70%, that's the probability that it will rain, not how much of that particular area or, or region will see rain It's it's the probability of seeing rain within their forecast area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Usually, seventy percent is a pretty high value. Right. Because the weather service. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yes. Yeah. <coughs> um, weather service offices in the last couple of in the last five or ten years are also starting to they have they forecast for counties, but within counties there can be two different climates. So they're starting to divide counties up based on the where the mountain ranges are. For example, in Western Maryland, Allegheny County, and Hampshire and Hardy County, I believe, the weather service in Sterling, Virginia. So basically, along the eastern Allegheny Ridge, those three counties are broken up into two different zones so that when they issue winter weather advisories or winter storm warnings that are covering lake effect snow events, it's for the western half of those counties because those areas are more prone to lake effect snow than downwind of the mountains where the downsloping occurs and you get drying out. And you can still get flurries from the r- leftover moisture, but the 
most moisture is going to be deposited as snow in the highest elevations. So that's a common theme that we're starting to see with the Weather Service offices and Mountain Valley Ridge systems is that they're, they're dividing counties up so they can be a little bit more hyper-local with their forecast. That'll probably continue to happen as time goes on, but um, that's just one example of how the Weather Service is starting this new initiative in the last 10 years to cater more specifically to certain folks that live in the mountains and get more snow than in the eastern part of the same county that might get a little bit less snow. Another way, another forecast tool, besides the models and looking at their biases and so forth and so on, but um, to short range prediction would be real time information from the uh, Storm Prediction Center. Uh, you can find the temperature, wind, humidity profile, the atmosphere. Um, each, some weather service offices across the country launch weather balloons up into the air and that information goes into the forecast models and that forecast model, of course, shows what's going to happen through time. But this information with the um, temperature, wind, and humidity profile of the atmosphere is available twice a day, 7 a.m., 7 to 8 a.m., and 7 to 8 p.m. So in the morning, you can see what the atmosphere looks like. And across different parts of the country, there are probably about 80 spots in the U.S. that have um, weather sound or soundings where you can see the temperature and moisture profile. Yeah, exactly. Dulles is a good example. Uh, lo so locally, Dulles, Roanoke, and Pittsburgh are the three that are closest in the mid-Atlantic that you can see what the profile looks like. And it's a good indication of the, how, how much moisture is available to the column. For example, in the soundings recently, it's been very moist all the way through the entire column, so it's been very cloudy. It's been very difficult to, to see at night because um, there's so much moisture in the atmosphere. But this information is available in the Storm Prediction Center website, which is the um, fifth bullet point down there. So you can look at these soundings, and the morning information the is available usually between 9 and 10 o'clock in the morning. The evening soundings are available usually by about 9 30 10 o'clock at night so it's based on uh, utc time so seven eight, when we turn the clocks back an hour they launch the balloons at 7 a.m so when we go to uh, standard time at 7 a.m local time is when the balloons are launched so usually by 9 or 9 30 the information is available usually about an hour to an hour and a half after uh, the balloons are launched. This information is available in the evening from 7 to 8 p.m. local time. No. So when we turn the clocks back an hour at 7 a.m. this time. Yeah, it, uh, it, yeah, it's based on Zulu time. But that's a really good indicator of how much moisture is available and the cloud cover. Um, so uh, besides reading the forecast uh, from the weather service and looking at the models, Real-time information to see the cloud cover potential is the Storm Prediction Center website. They also have a mesoscale analysis page where you can look at surface patterns, upper level patterns, moisture content that inc could impact your area. And I'll show some of you some of these in a little bit. But um, it's good for very short-term forecasting from just a user perspective instead of relying on forecast models uh, information. You can look at yourself, kind of identify what pattern you might be seeing later tonight or so forth and so on to see um, if the weather is going to be good for viewing purposes. And then you can also look at the trends to see if there's been a trend for increased moisture across your area or decreasing moisture or if a front has come through. Um, it's a very good tool to use for now casting and it's beneficial in all four seasons even for, for snow potential. Also one thing that uh, affects viewing is dew and, and frost. And there's a, a couple things if you're looking at the w weather data yourself to try to determine if there's a potential for dew or frost is that you need to look at the, is moisture abnormally, is the soil moisture abnormally moist or dry? Well, lately it's been very moist because we've had a very wet summer. Are the winds expected to be calm overnight? In order to get dew or frost, you need uh, ample moisture at the surface, clear skies at night, and light winds that helps produce the dew and frost. Are you located in a valley or a mountaintop? Well, valleys tend to produce, if you're in a valley and you have, uh, it's been a very wet summer, the skies are clear 
after a weather system moves through, the winds are light, the weather system produced rain during the day, that's a really good opportunity to see frost and especially, well, frost if the temperature's going to be below freezing, but dew and fog the next morning. So those are some, th some things to consider with uh, dew and frost potential. And also, how green is the ve vegetation in your area? Obviously, we're in the summertime, so everything's green. But once we get into the fall, fall, uh, especially late fall, there are a couple uh, links down there that I have. And uh, this uh, PowerPoint will probably be available a little bit later as well. But um, with these links, you can see some of this information that I'm talking about, soil moisture and the greenness. Because if there's widespread green vegetation in your area, that's going to produce better chance for producing dew. And the temperatures will lead to frost. If it's 38 to 42 degrees, you can still get patchy frost. 33 to 37, uh, you'll have areas of frost and widespread frost or freeze if it's, if it's below freezing. It basically has to do with both the grass and the leaves, the greenness, yeah, overall. Um, Yeah. So if the ambient is that, the radiant cooling will bring it down six or eight degrees. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's the interesting thing that can be concerned about a lot. Because people wonder why they're getting heavy dew when it's relatively warm. Right. So yeah, there's a little bit of a wide range there in the, in the temperatures. Now, speaking from perspective of where we stand right now with the weather pattern going into the fall season since we've had a surplus of rain the summer and fall we're very subjective we're, or, or, <laughs> we are very um, acclimated to seeing dew so we will see many not going forward in October and November we are going to see many nights with fog and dew because we've had so much moisture we've had so much rain so the potential is high for this fall season and um, in the winter time too, going into the early part of the winter to see dew and frost. And as you can see, this is the soil moisture anomaly from September 8th. So this is saying how far below, above or below normal the soil moisture is relative to what it should be and what it is this time of the year. There's been a ridge of high pressure that's produced a lot of dry weather in the west. So there's a lot of dry soils in the west. But once you get into the areas that have had a lot of rain recently from the Central Plains, the upper Mississippi Valley, look at the bullseye here across our region, especially east of the mountains where soil moisture is abnormally high and along the Gulf Coast. So the areas where the soil moisture has been abnormally high is the areas that will likely see more dew than normal, more frost than normal heading into the fall season once we finally get into somewhat of a drier pattern. Um, well, when we get into a drier pattern, I should say. But um, those anomalies can help predict, depending on where you live, those anomalies can help predict um, where you might see the, the better potential for dew or frost with those particular weather systems with high pressure in place, clear skies at night. So this um, map came from one of the links on the previous slide. And this is the current greenness map. So this is an interactive map and you can zoom into certain areas to see the vegetation, if, it, if it's very green or if it's trending less green because we're in the colder season and the, um, you know, the leaves have dropped off in certain places. So I believe it's sensor extrapolation. There's a void across I think because of um, unable to pick up some of the data across West Virginia and North Carolina. So I think there's why, why there's a void in that particular, in this particular region. But this is the one from yesterday. So as you can see, we're still in the warm season and everything is still green and we haven't had a significant drought to cause the leaves to come off a little bit early, um, which is another factor too. If we would have had a really dry summer and a really dry early part of the fall season, then the leaves would drop off earlier and that would lead to um, the greenness fading very quickly. But we haven't had that. We've had a very green season so far, fall, early fall, and then of course through the summer. 
but this image helps to get an idea of the greenness and how much vegetation is around. There's another very good weather tool to use um, for uh, those wishing to look ahead to see if there's potential for fog and cloud cover and rain during the overnight period. It's a program that's available to anyone, the public. It's called a Buffkit program. And we use this at work and, meteorolo and meteorologists, the weather service use this as well. It's a forecast visualization tool and you get to see the temperature, wind, humidity through time. There's a bar at the bottom you can scroll across and get the information. And I have a couple examples of it, but it's used to diagnose forecast to predict cloud cover and the potential for wind gusts and so forth and so on. The data comes from weather balloons that are sent up at weather service offices. So you can't get the specific forecast information for your specific location, but you look for the nearest um, airport identifier, uh, the nearest airport to where you live, for example, and you can get that information that's ingested into the model data. So all you need is that three letter identifier. For example, EKN is Elkins, West Virginia, and that'd be the nearest to this specific location. Um, you can also look there online. There's multiple different sources to look at what's called MOS output. It's basically forecast model data that shows what the temperature is going to be through time, the morning temperature, the high temperature in the afternoon. And that information is available online as well. And also I have the link there it's, uh, to identify the nearest airport to where you live. A weather service has a page um, with all the identifiers and that's the third link down. Model output statistics, yeah. So for example, this is what the program actually looks like here. Um, this is a screenshot, EKN is Elkins, West Virginia, which is the nearest one to this location. And basically, if you scroll from right to left here at the top, it takes you through time. So normally you would think you would go left to right, but in this program it goes the opposite way. So this is looking at, this was the forecast from the models yesterday morning for Monday this morning at 6 a.m. And basically what it's showing is the squiggly lines here are the temperature and dew point. So this is the temperature through the atmosphere and this is the dew point through the atmosphere. And these levels are f thousands of feet, 5,000 feet above the surface, 10,000, 15, so forth and so on. And this right here is the wind speed and wind direction as you go up in height. So what it was showing is that there's a, and where the two lines collide is where you have the cloud cover. So it was showing a pretty good cloud cover. Uh, I'll stand over here. Is, is uh, the pointer not working? Oh, I could use that. You're right. Uh, oh, uh, this one. Ah, okay. So good idea. So this one right here, this is where you would have the cloud cover where the, where the temperature and dew point come together. So this model was showing some decent cloud cover this morning. And then what we have here is the wind. This is surface wind right here. So it's light out of the southeast. And then as you go up, it increases out of the southwest. Well, that's a good signature of a warm front nearby. And warm fronts tend to produce a lot of low stratus clouds, which we are seeing out there right now. And um, the model was picking up on some of the, the moisture there as well. Um, but of course, when you cater it to your specific location, we're 4,000 feet up, so we're kind of in this zone right here. Um, and the cloud base isn't too far off the ground. So it's actually a pretty good representation of what's going on right now. It was from yesterday morning. Uh, so it's a pretty good program to identify the potential for uh, w wind gusts and also uh, cloud cover. So these lines down here is uh, temperature in degrees Celsius. So 20 degrees Celsius, 10 degrees Celsius, so forth and so on. So as you go up here, there's a little bit, the temperature actually starts to increase a little bit. It's called an inversion in the atmosphere. And then it uh, decreases with height. So it gets colder as you go up. Uh, Elkins? Uh, the airport? Yeah. I think it's like two or 2,500 feet. I can find it. There's actually on the one of the websites I had, I'll show you, it, it gives you the actual elevation of it. Um, so this, this 
same right oh right here oh uh, It is uh, above sea level. Yes. Okay. Yeah. The temperature inversion is hypothetical. The lowest. That doesn't make sense. Oh yeah, right. Because we're yeah, because we're. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're above that inversion. And so it's okay. And, and that's and that's just about like one of the complications is some of this stuff tells you what the temperature would be if we were at sea level at that point. Mm-hmm. And. Yeah, and then uh, so yeah, so that's that's yeah, it's through the column there, and when you have strong winds aloft too, that that'll help produce a lot of uh, cloud cover because basically these winds above the surface are coming out of the southwest and they're basically going up against the mountains here, so that's going to enhance the cloud cover locally. So this is kind of just a model depiction, but there's actually a little bit more cloud cover than what's depicted here. And that's because the enhancement of the southwest wind coming up the western side of the Appalachians, and you get more cooling and condensing. So again, m models aren't they're 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 good to an extent, but you have to cater to your to your local area. So when when you when you anytime you see a profile where you have a southeast wind at the surface and a very strong southwest wind aloft, that leaves a little bit more cloud cover than what the models are showing. Um, and then over here are the stability indices of the atmosphere. Some of the things we look at to forecast the potential for heavy rain or thunderstorms. Um, most of these are, most of these indicators right now show a very stable atmosphere. And in order to have a very unstable atmosphere, you have to have um, a very strong cooling aloft and you have to have a, a mechanism to provide ample amounts of lift that produces a lot of rain. So some of these numbers over here, this is convective available potential, potential yeah, convective available potential energy up here. Um, another thing to look at would be precipitable water. That's the amount of water in the atmosphere, 1.68 inches, which is pretty high. Anything over one, anything over one and a half is decent. Over, over two inches can produce very heavy downpours. So that's some of the information but of particular concern to viewing weather would be looking at the um, amount of moisture in the atmosphere and also looking at the uh, low level winds. It depends on the topography. For example, I would say um, using Elkins would be a very good indicator for the weather locally. You could also um, get an idea. You could also compare it to uh, JST Johnstown, which is a little bit farther north, but it's still along the same ridge line. So I wouldn't use um, Elkins for Martinsburg. I would use Hagerstown for Martinsburg because Hagerstown's in the same valley. So I would use the model data from the nearest airport that best represents the topography that you live in. So, um, and then there's a little bit m more uh, model output available for the big East Coast cities. Like you can get Baltimore and DC, but even though they're fairly close, but it's a little bit more sporadic in coverage once you get into the mountain locations. But I would say that um, it's good for about 40 to 50 miles, but I would also look at the topography and if there's a closer site to where you live that best represents the topography if the site that you um, see is uh, in a valley for example like Elkins would be great for this area uh, Hagerstown would be good for I-81 Dulles and DCA and Baltimore would be good for I-95 and then you go up towards Philadelphia so forth and so on uh, Pittsburgh has its Pittsburgh has its own weather data uh, Johnstown does uh, and I just some of these from from experience but yeah generally 40 to 50 miles but be careful about topography issues we observe a lot in the Piedmont west of DC Winchester Front Royal Manassas area so Dulles is pretty good for us yeah Dullis International is there there's 
Uh, OKV does. You can get MOS data from OKV Winchester. Uh, yeah, and also uh, you can get this data, Buffkit data for its it's a site called WOO, and it's out towards best represents the weather in the central Shenandoah Valley, so towards Harrisonburg, Virginia. There's a site that I'll show you that has um, a map of all the places where you can find it. But this is the output that, that what it looks like. And there's also another part of this program where if you click a button at the top here to uh, let's see uh, overview, if you click overview here, this gives you the same information as you go through time. So Sunday morning on, on the right and Friday is all the way on the left. And what this is showing, you can turn on and turn off different parameters up here, precipitation, cloud cover, so forth and so on. So what I have here, these, this is precipitation, these barbs, and you have to scroll across with your mouse to see how much. But this is basically showing where you have the greatest concentration of rain, the higher looking barbs here, and then where you have the humidity and where you have the cloud cover. So basically it's showing lots of cloud cover over the next couple of days is basically what this is showing. But um, it's a good indicator of, of trends. So this is uh, Sunday, this was yesterday. So this is today, Monday, because I don't, this is from yesterday's model data. Um, so going through time, there's a period, there's later, but once we get through Thursday, it starts to, the sun starts to come out a bit. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, finally, right? <laughs> but uh, at least this is a good idea to get uh, trends and on uh, temperature and relative humidity and so forth. But it's a really good program, and the Weather Service uses this a lot to put together their forecasts as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right here? Yeah, so you just had the mid high level clouds here, yeah. And they're a little more scattered in nature as you get farther out. <laughs> <laughs> and again, this is just one this is just the GFS run. I just chose one just to illustrate the uh information here. Um so this is the GFS in their its forecast for this area. Um, and then there's some local, uh, this, these couple of graphics here, I'll just go through these pretty quickly, but you can have uh, local effects with the wind. So for example, if you have low pressure to your north and high pressure to the south, you generally, the wind around low pressure goes counterclockwise, or wind around high pressure goes clockwise, so you would tend to get some, a bit of a west wind, but adjacent to the mountain range, you could get a little bit more of a south wind. Um, and then that graphic on the top is just showing kind of like a mesoscale effect with the pressure systems and how they would lead to different changes in wind direction. And the bottom image here is showing uh, if you have high pressure to the east and low pressure to the west, you would tend to get a pretty good southerly gradient all the way, um, pretty parallel southerly flow from the mountains um, to the west of the mountains as well. These are just some graphics showing some localized effects with in terms of, of wind direction um, and wind speed. And also when you have uh, a gap in the mountains, it could be a water gap or a wind gap where there's just a break between two ridges and it's very close together, you tend to get the strongest winds on the, uh, s on the side of the gap closest to the low pressure center. So if you were looking at a weather map and you saw low pressure coming up from the Ohio Valley, similar to what we have going on now with the warm front moving through and high pressure that's off to the east, um, you would, and you have some sort of a mesoscale effect if you are located in a gap in the Appalachians where you would tend to get some of the strongest winds closer to the low pressure side of the gap um, versus the uh, eastern side uh, of the gap if it was oriented in that direction. Uh, this weather map here is from the uh, WPC, the Weather Prediction Center. It's updated frequently during the day. It gives you an idea of where the pressure systems are. So for example, this is from last evening, low pressure across the Ohio Valley. There's the warm front to the south, and that warm front's helping to provide the low clouds that we have out there right now. Uh, pretty big high pressure to the north, and that uh, this high pressure initially brought this front that's stationary to the south that brought the colder air in, so you probably felt it get much colder here 
over the weekend, probably, I don't know, Friday night or Saturday, when that cold air was starting to come down. It's a wedge that usually, this is very common in the winter time to see a pattern like this. And this, uh, a setup like this in the winter time would bring snow and mixed precipitation events, basically, because of the thermal profile. Um, and then you can see all the different weather systems. So this is a good site here to see exactly what's going on from a synoptic view, in other words, large scale weather systems and how they would affect your weather. And then, uh, windy website. I'm not sure about that. Um, probably not. This is just, a, this is a government produced map that the, uh, they have folks that actually um, hand draw this and then they put it in a computer like computer program and then they post it so that's posted every couple of hours it's updated every couple of hours during the day and nighttime and then this is actually a product we use at work um, this shows all of the uh, what are weather bug stations we so basically we our company's earth networks but we uh, own the weather bug products so we own the data so we display the data um, on our site. So this is a professional product that shows a screen capture of the winds, the hourly wind gusts across much of the western part of the mid-Atlantic and eastern part of the Ohio Valley and the wind direction and so forth and so on. So this is a good, this is a tool that we use to do some localized forecasting for our different clients. And this is just a screen capture, it just happens to be the, the wind direction. But we can see all kinds of different information, lightning, trends we can see radar satellites and uh, so forth and so on but this was showing a pretty good uh, setup for breezy winds because we had the high pressure to the north and low pressure to the south so that was producing a bit of a easterly wind component and the highest gusts were located along the highest mountains where you normally would expect that so we had some decent wind gusts and this is up over um, western Pennsylvania east of Pittsburgh um, in the higher mountain tops there, but it's a pretty good product and helps us with the forecasting. And the last thing I just want to touch base. Well, last thing I want to touch base on is the different types of fog that I was mentioning earlier. Uh, radiation fog is fog that is especially produced when you have rain the night before and then you get clear skies, um, helps, helps to uh, moisten the soil and create some higher dew points. You need light winds to help create uh, radiational fog. And that uh, potential is here uh, tonight and tomorrow night when the, if the sky does clear out. Looks like tomorrow night might be the best chance. Precipitation fog is uh, fog that forms when rain is falling through cold air. So basically common with uh, warm fronts, like we have warm front moving through right now. And what happens is cold air uh, dry at the surface while the rain is falling through it evaporates causes the dew point to rise so it's called evaporational cooling so you can get fog when uh, precipitation starts especially if the air is pretty dry initially saturation occurs and forms fog um, but it's more common with warm fronts like we're seeing with the rain that's moving through now so precipitation fog common with warm fronts and then evection fog especially if we get a situation in the winter time where we get a fresh snowpack on the ground and then a warm front starts to move through. So you get warm, moist air blowing up the cold on top of the snowpack that produces advection fog. So that's more common once we get into the uh, winter time. Steam fog, upslope fog, uh, freezing fog, and, and ice fog are also common. So it, during the, right now we're in a good time of the year to also see steam fog where the, as the summer ends, water temperatures um, don't cool right away, but the air cools pretty rapidly and uh, this massive dry cold air moves over a warmer lake and produces fog so it's re really common if you have uh, fog uh, or if you have lakes and, and rivers and so forth and so on nearby um, so that steam fog and the upslope fog which is common in the, in the West Virginia mountains and the Appalachians where moist air blows up the mount moist air moves up the mountains and glides up over it to form um, upslope fog it can happen uh, last night would have been a pretty good example of, of some upslope fog that was potentially developing in the Appalachians and then valley fog 
uh, forms when the soil is moist from the uh, previous rain. As the sky clears, you allow the temperature to cool near the dew point. So you get valley fog. So you can get all sorts of different fog developing whenever you have um, a moist ground like we have now. So we're really prone to fog going into the fall season, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, when we have clear skies at night. And then freezing fog, of course, temperatures below freezing and uh, ice fog in the polar and arctic regions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That would be neat. Mm -hmm. So you've, you've seen it locally here too, right? That's what you're saying? Yeah. That would be. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> you probably see a lot of the 4,000 feet, I guess. A lot of these different patterns. What's that? They're pretty much the same thing. Uh, radiation, I mean, valley fog forms because you have a cold, cooler, dense air settles down into the valleys between the mountain ridges. So at night, on a clear night with calm wind, you can get colder temperatures in the valley floor versus on top of the mountain. And then especially if you have a body of water like a lake or a river, you can get the fog form in the, in the valley. And radiational fog is pretty much the same thing where you get the sky that clears at night and then radiational cooling causes temperature to cool to the dew point and you get, and you get that sort of fog. And you can identify fog patterns on this Buffkit program, which is a great program, like I said, to download. Um, I was looking at the data last night, and it looked like, well, we have some potential, I guess, Wednesday morning. If you see uh, some clearing skies here, so where the temperature and dew point are pretty far spread, spread far apart, um, you get clear skies aloft, and at the surface, very light wind. And uh, this model output is showing some fog development, especially uh, near and below um, 5,000 feet, which is where we are. So this is an example of how you can see fog on this pr particular program if you, if you download it. What you're looking for for fog formation is these lines here to be pretty far apart above about five, 6,000 feet. That means you get clearing skies and you want the winds at the surface to be very light. Um, and then surface all the way up through uh, probably about uh, three or 4,000 feet, we have light winds. So this could be an example where you get fog down towards the uh, valley floor and then perhaps some advection fog this, this high up at 4,000 feet. But I would expect by Wednesday morning there would be some fog at least between the ridges around here and uh, through the mid-Atlantic states. So this is kind of like an overview of forecasting weather for your specific location. You can look at the forecast model data, you can look at the model data, um, and then compare it to what's going on in real time. You can look at the storm prediction website and look for different synoptic patterns to come up with um, a forecast. One thing to keep in mind once we get into the winter season is the temperatures on clear skies with light winds, you can get temperatures that are five to 10 degrees colder than what the model is showing, especially with the fresh snowpack on the ground. So once we get in the winter season, we get a snowstorm that produces at least three, four inches of snow covers the ground that um, the model data tends to, it does compensate for, um, it, the equations in the model do change a little bit once we get into the winter season, but even so mesoscale effects, small scale effects with, with snowpack on the ground it still won't pick up on the degree of radiational cooling that occurs with that. So when you're looking at the model output numbers, you see a low temperature maybe of 25 degrees and there was just a snowstorm during the day that produced five to 10 inches of snow. That 25 degrees may turn into 15 degrees because the radiational cooling from the effect of the long wave radiation coming from the albedo effect of snow reflecting a lot of heat in the atmosphere. So once we get in the winter season, you wanna be cautious about temperatures at night. They can be five to 10 degrees colder um, especially if, if you've had a, a snowstorm that just impacted your area and produced a fresh fresh snowpack. And um, that can lead to a f freezing fog formation as well. 
Um, so here's the website I was talking about earlier where you can find the model data. I plugged in EKN Elkins and this particular site gives you the elevation and it says, well it's in meters, so 603 meters above sea level. So it gives you the elevation of um, each airport. And then what this is showing is it's called the GFS lamp guidance. It basically gives you an hourly breakdown of temperature, wind direction, the percent chance of rain, so forth and so on. This is a good quick reference tool for looking at the potential for cloud cover um, temperatures and dew points and, and wind direction. The wind is in cardinal direction, so it says 171718. That's 180 degrees, which is on a compass out of the south. And then this gives you the wind gust potential, the surface wind, the percent chance of rainfall, and the um, cloud cover. OV means overcast. So it's a good kind of a quick reference tool to look at the weather um, in the afternoon or evening to see if there's potential for cloud cover at night. What's that? Yeah, yeah. The, the, uh, on that site, I think it... Yeah. And then I'll talk a little bit about Florence. That's in the news, of course. Um, it's a hurricane. And basically, there's a lot of different information to look at uh, forecast tracks of, of tropical systems. And this is actually the information from this morning. So this is the uh, forecast track. Upper left here is the European forecast track. And then this is um, a depiction of a a uh, couple of different models, other different models. So meteorologists look at the forecast track for these tropical systems. Of course, you want to reference all the different models to look at what they're saying. But uh, at this point, it looks like a pretty good impact for the Carolinas, probably on Friday. There's numbers here, and these numbers indicate how many um, hours from the current time frame we're looking at the storm to be in these different locations. So. Basically, it's, I mean, it's hard to see back there, but looks like a Carolina coast storm here. And then after that, these tropical systems, after they make landfall, they tend to move north and and curve. Get they get caught caught in the westerly winds. But given the lack of uh, jet stream winds aloft locally, the storm probably won't take its time moving up through the Mid Atlantic and produce copious amounts of rain around here. <laughs> it it should there's actually I don't have it on here but uh the uh, sea surface temperature sea surface temperature anomalies are a bit high along the east coast. So it's probably going to be a major hurricane as it uh approaches and makes landfall. There's some pretty warm water along the east coast. And um, it's going to be a pretty good storm for us, I think. This is the intensity guide, guidance for it. Uh, this is all available on the internet as well. This is going out in time, so it does peak here at a category four. And then as you can see, once it makes landfall, um, it'll weaken considerably as it gets onto land. But at that point, it'll be more of a heavy rain threat than anything else. So Carolinas will probably have significant storm surge and significant damage from it. And then we'll have a decent flooding threat from the Carolinas all the way up into the, through the mid-Atlantic, especially with all the rain we've had lately. So there's going to be a lot of stream and river flooding later, this probably this weekend from the storm. Um, and this is, I just put this in for grins. This is Wilmington, North Carolina. This is the same program I was showing you a little bit earlier. Uh, Wilmington being in the path of the storm for Florence. Friday, when it's probably near Wilmington, if not somewhere north or inland. Uh, you can see the winds here, very, very strong in the profile. So, And then uh, these are the winds here are knots. And then lots of rain. The temperature and dew point are the basically, it's a saturated all the way up to the jet stream level. I mean, there's everything's pointing to a very dangerous situation for the Carolinas. This is as I think the, see the winds are out of the northwest. So 
basically this forecast model, the GFS is showing that um, Florence would probably be um, north of their location to get the wraparound northwest wind. But this is kind of an indication of some of the information that you can see from it. Oh, uh, this is showing what the precipitation type would be. So rain, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Probably, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to take, yeah, I don't want to. But, um, yeah, the, I'll have, I'll include a couple more links in the PowerPoint presentation. The link to the download that program, the, the Buffkit program, which would help you assess the potential for clouds and fog and rain and so forth and so on for viewing weather. Um, and also I'll put a link in there for another program. It's called GR Level 3. It's a really good radar program that updates on its own if you have it open on your computer. And you can look at uh, different radar products to see where there is potential for not only heavy rain, but also mist and fog and so forth and so on. That program is, does there's a monthly fee for the GR Level 3 program, but I'll put the link on in the PowerPoint as well. I think it's $9.99 a month, but it's a good program to have if you're concerned about um, rain. And you can get radar images from any of the weather service radar sites across the U.S., and no, no, it's just real, real, real time information. Yeah, radar scope is also a good one too. Probably have it on your phone. Yeah. Mm hmm. Weather stations. I know many of them will predict. Do they have? Do they tend to follow one of the models? No idea. Oh, you mean uh, weather stations as in? As in we have one out here from a company called Davis. Oh, Davis Weather, yeah. yeah thinking, do they like tend to follow GFS, tend to follow European, when they predict out, say, the next 48 hours, whatever? Oh, okay. In terms of uh, those forecasts, which produce, you know, hourly forecasts and beyond, there are multiple different ways in which a forecast is produced. We have our own in-house model at Earth Networks that produces that. AccuWeather has their own in-house model. I'm not sure about Davis, but um, most of those, for example, the ones you see on TV, the future casts that you see that meteorologists show on television, that's usually based on the uh, North American model, most of that input. I'm not sure about Davis, though. Probably from one of those models, the North American or GFS model. Yeah. Yeah, they have their own in-house model, yeah. weather.com. Yeah. The The I will say that the hourly forecast whichever whichever application you have on your phone, hourly forecast is a good indicator of what's it's like an overview of what's going to happen for the next 24 hours but i would not put my money on certain hours that they forecast certain days. yeah i i wouldn't i would use it as an overview but i wouldn't i would not use it as planning ahead for five o'clock this afternoon, what, what does it say? I would see what it, what the forecast is around that five o'clock hour because convection, especially in the convective season, once we get into the wintertime season, it's a little bit more accurate because synoptic weather systems tend to produce weather over a larger area versus convection, which can be localized. So if the hourly forecast says five o'clock, 100% chance of thunderstorms, and let's say six o'clock says 0%, but four o'clock says 40%, I would say that when you look at the hourly forecast, if if the percent chance of rain increases from like three o'clock to six, I'm just giving an example, three to six o'clock, I would use that window as when the best chance of rain is. But convection 
will never be forecasted on the hour by these hourly these hourly applications it's just impossible because the science there will never be science <coughs> that that is able to pinpoint exactly what time a storm is going to form so it's basically saying it's like a grid point on a on a forecast output saying okay at five o'clock on this afternoon uh there's going to be two inches of rain in a certain spot that's con it's called convective feedback in the modeling basically sh saying that uh, this particular spot has the best chance of rain at this time, but I would interpret that as anywhere between a th give a three hour range that you're going to see a thunderstorm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because every every square foot of the United of the world has its own personality based on exactly. Things. Right. It's up to the meteorologist, the local meteorologist, to become familiar with that and know how to adapt the model to that local area. Exactly. Yep, that's exactly what we do. Is and you. The right word, or you were using con uh, uh, not, like yeah, characteristics of the local area. Right. Yeah, exactly. Mesoscale. Oh, micro, yeah, mesoscale is like within a 15 to 20 mile radius of around your area. Uh, yeah, pretty much, yeah, or this land area right here. So yeah, a meteorologist takes that data, um, also takes into account climatology. Is this, uh, looking out in the future, is this storm, yeah, mm -hmm. is this storm, can this storm, is this storm really something that could occur this time of the year? you know, or so forth and so on. Or are we in an anomalous pattern where yes, the storm is, is possible. So for example, if Florence is happening during the peak of the hurricane season. I mean, if, if the forecast models were showing a cat five in June approaching the Carolina coast, a meteorologist will look at that information and look at the current information and say, well, this doesn't make sense because the water temperatures are a little bit cooler, so forth. And so. I mean, the models usually wouldn't do something like that because the models have climatology in their equations, but we take the information and we predict the weather based on climatology, our assessment and so forth. Yeah, exactly. So when it comes to forecasting that we take all that information into account. Yeah, and I, I will say that the GO-16 has been very beneficial. It provides a lot of s detailed resolution to help identify where thunderstorms are likely to form and uh, cloud cover. So that GO-16 that uh, satellite that was recently became public information and, you know, you can access that information online. It really sees uh, the satellite. It, it provides instantaneous information uh, go 16 yeah yeah uh, goes yeah geostationary yeah it provides like it provides satellite information every 15 minutes so yeah it's very detailed though so you can really get a good idea on a small scale where thunderstorms are going to develop it's a very good tool too <laughs> It's not going to, yeah. But it's hour by hour, out to 48 hours. The other one is called Clear Outside, and it's based on um, a company in uh, Devon, UK. And they give the same kind.
kind of, of astronomy oriented forecast that we find helpful and it also has sun and moon data mm. with it. So um, we use these sources, but again, there's sat dissatisfaction levels with these when you're trying to base a decision uh, two hours out or three hours, What's four that? hours. Am I going to pack up and leave and drive an hour and set up to view for I the night? Mm -hmm. It's not what I thought it would be. But anyway, are you familiar with either one of these uh, uh, apps for, for astronomy? The clear sky clock? N the clear outside? No. Okay. No. I will, I will say that a lot of the forecast model data is more accurate overnight than during the day, especially for convection. So there's a little bit more accuracy when you look at it for the time frame of like midnight to 6 a.m. versus noon to 6 and trying to forecast exactly if convection is going to be over a certain spot at a certain hour. But nonetheless, as you go out in time, it still has, you know, some inaccuracies. But at least for um, the overnight period, it seems that uh, most models do a much a little better job, especially with that... Um, study that I was reading that I pointed out that the forecast models tend to be a little bit more accurate from like midnight to 6 a.m. Well, convection really only occurs heavily during the day. Yeah. That's the random component of total weather. Exactly. Uh, convection cells tend to be less than a mile or two in diameter. Right? Yeah, and they usually, I mean, a pulse storm would last, it would develop and, and dissipate 20 to 25 minutes, so you're talking about a span of it develops, rains itself out, and then dissipates, and that's a span of 20 to 25 minutes, and trying to determine that. that from the That what? You can wait through that. Yeah, you can wait through that, right, right. Yeah, it is more difficult. And it's also based on someone's interpretation. For example, you know, missing a forecast is subjective. And if, and what it, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. So <laughs> that wasn't forecast, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, one of the big challenges, well, in the summertime, the challenge with the forecast model data is pinpointing exactly when the thunderstorms will occur. In the wintertime, it's forecasting, at least in the East Coast, nor'easters. We're all familiar with that. You know, one model will show the storms coming up the East Coast. One model will show going out to sea. So that's the difference between six inches of snow and nothing, or a foot of snow and partly cloudy skies. Oh. And then it started to snow heavily. Yeah. Four to eight. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. Yeah. 
Hide the coast. Mm hmm. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, let me, let me take the, uh, the, the coordinator's prerogative. We could talk about weather for a long time. Uh, are there any more questions specifically about forecasting and, and, and its relevance to, uh, to astronomy? Um, I guess I have one, and that is, um, is there any guidance that tells us the, um, the, the spottiness of cloud formations? You know, whether we're going to get... Because uh, one of the things that frustrates me, frustrates me is like you get 70% cloud cover. Well, does that mean is is going to be thin overall or popcorn clouds or wh what the astronomers call sucker holes, um, you know, which sometimes we can use and sometimes we can't uh, because we, we will observe if the sky is not overcast. But right. we'd like to know how worthwhile it is for the kinds of clouds which will form. Yeah, that program that I was showing you, that Buffkit program, would be the best alternative to um, complementing the Weather Service forecast for cloud cover with to see what the potential for uh, cloud, cloud formation is. Um, because when you take that information and you look at the, the overnight period, you can see if there's high thin clouds on the uh, Buffkit program, the temperature and dew point lines would be very close together but high up, like 25, 30,000 feet. The Weather Service classifies that as mostly cloudy skies because the cirrus clouds are taking up most of the cloud, most of the sky. And during the day, that would be mostly cloudy too, but you'd see the sun poking through. So um, my best um, information to you for that would be to look at the Weather Service forecast for cloud cover and then look and then look at this program to see what type of cloud cover it is based on where the, the, the level of moisture is in the atmosphere by looking at this program. That would be the best thing. Another thing to look at besides that program, if you don't have the time to look at the program and to see where the moisture profile um, or where the moisture is advecting in the atmosphere to see if whether it's pop up clouds or um, just the high thin cirrus clouds is the Weather Service Office also puts out a forecast discussion after they issue their forecast. They put out one in the early morning, they update it midday, and they have one in the afternoon. So is you can also... A forum or some kind? Yeah, it's like a technical discussion talking about their forecast that they have. Public? Yeah, it's public. Yeah, you can see um, it's public information. You can Scroll read through... down on the page. On the, on the Weather Service page. Yeah, on the Weather Service page. And it says forecast discussion um, at the bottom. And that gives you a technical discussion of what they're forecasting and why they're forecasting it. And um, they will tend to put some information about the cloud cover in that discussion as well. So I would say use the information on your application. Look at the Weather Service forecast for cloud cover. If you have the chance, use this program to look at uh, where the moisture, uh, where the cloud cover is going to be. Is it high thin clouds or is it low level clouds like we're seeing out there right now? Um, and also read their forecast discussion to see uh, what they are saying in terms of cloud cover because if it was like a high thin cirrus cloud, they would say, um, you know, cirrus clouds advecting ahead of a approaching low pressure ce center, so going mostly cloudy for tonight. It would be a short sentence about the cloud cover, but at least you would be able to get some information about it. And then, but, um, but it's very ambiguous because mostly cloudy to them is just talking about the amount of sky that's going to be covered by some form of moisture. So high thin cirrus clouds like we know you can see through. But if you actually look at the profiles um, online yourself or read the discussion, you'll be able to know what kind of cloud cover they're, they're talking about. They've got a forecast for the general public. And general yeah, it's a general, in a general impression of what the sky yeah, is. They, yeah, they just produce general types of forecasts. So they don't get into specific clouds in their, unless you get into their discussion, you can read that information. So 
that's my advice is to uh, look at the moisture profiles predicted by the forecast models, read their discussion, and so you can see whether it's high thin cirrus clouds or, or not. I will say that high thin cirrus clouds are more common ahead of large scale weather systems. So mostly cloudy. When you see a forecast sunny today, mostly cloudy tonight, mostly cloudy tomorrow, 50% chance of showers that would probably be from an approaching weather system that produces the high thin cirrus clouds and then the cloud deck lowers as you get closer to the storm. But um, they would have that in their technical discussion. That would be the only way that I would be able to, that would be my only advice is to, to look at that information yourself and to decipher uh, yourself what, what type of cloud cover. So the answer is to develop our own uh, skills. Yeah, own skills, yeah, yeah. Oh, tonight? <laughs> I... Let me, let me take a look. Uh, let's see. I actually have... Uh, let's see. Oh, there you go. You can see the trends too as I scroll through here. I think this is from yeah, that's from last night. So this is the most recent information. No, this is just one model though. Yeah. Yeah. Although there is some potential. Let's see if I have drier air, drier air, yeah, yeah, at that level. So we're talking like ten thousand feet, fifteen thousand feet, twenty. Uh, so this was. These are all the reasons why you go to the Atacama Desert. Oh, you know. Yeah, right. So you don't have to worry about. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I would say probably not good tonight. Let's see if I can. See if the <coughs> see th also the model data comes out twice well actually four times a day. This is okay. So comes out usually well between ten AM and well nine thirty and eleven thirty AM it comes out. There's also an intermediate run at eighteen Z which comes out by late afternoon and then the evening forecast models usually come out in this um program between 10.30 and midnight. Once we turn the clocks back an hour, once we get into standard time, then all the model data comes in an hour early because it's all based on UTC time. So, this is the application that, yeah, it's called the Buffkit program. It's, it's, it's the best at uh, looking at cloud cover potential by just looking at the models and what they're saying, so. I would say that it does look like it's starting to brighten up a little bit out, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. So that's kind of what the trends are showing here. And then, yeah. <laughs> Looks like uh, we get into a little bit of an inversion tomorrow morning. There's still a lot of moisture. Yeah. And then if I look at the actual, like, pattern... Um, this is a good site to use for weather forecasting. There's a bunch of different sites to look at forecast models. This is a really good one too. It's called the high resolution model. Uh, you can zoom into, it runs every hour. Uh, <laughs> 
uh, you can click on a particular region and actually gives you cloud cover. Like this one's starting to run 14Z, which you subtract four hours right now. It's, it's running the 10 o'clock stuff right now. So if I go to this one right here, um, and then all products, average cloud cover, <laughs> that goes through seven that's seven Zulu which is seven three AM. Oh, uh, and you can actually scroll over and see the percentage. So like sixty percent in this area. This is Oh, like this looks like. Yeah. At each one of the points, and, and they actually do the entire North America for cloud cover. And what they do is they do the time, they display the time series at the point you designate. But they're doing this in pre day. So if you can look at the upwind. And uh, see what's yeah. to some extent. Also on this site. Also on this site too, you can get the same information you get in that other program. I think if I right click, I don't know, let me left click. Uh, I think I need a mouse to do it. I know if I right click on it. Oh, no, no. you can get the sounding information too, but I think I need a mouse to do it. Right, left, no. uh, so because this runs every hour, but I know that. I know I can do it on my phone too, but um, basically there's an option if you're using the computer, you can right click on it and or left click I think you right click and then a, a a bar comes up that says click here for sounding information. So you can get the sounding information, which is the the moisture profile to the atmosphere for this particular time of the day. So you say sixty eight percent chance of cloud cover. If you want to see where the cloud cover is focused, you can click and it'll come up with another image that shows Yeah. I just think I need a mouse or something for it. Okay. Well, I think we need to thank Chad. So. <laughs> I'll add some of these links onto the PowerPoint that will eventually be put online, right? Yeah. Okay. So. And we, and we do the video. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming up here. Oh, sure. No problem.